I'm a bass fisherman. This is a completely different environment for me. I'm going to tell you a lot about my life in a minute, and i got a story. But, uh, you know, the Holy Spirit speaks to you when you're saved. And the Holy Spirit has really been working on me this morning. Uh, I'm out of my element. I will quickly admit that. I have the opportunity to speak to a lot of people, and I share my testimony uh, on a pretty regular basis, so I'm pretty comfortable with that. But I feel extremely challenged this morning. I, uh, I, want to, uh, I want to be a servant, and I want to deliver and encourage you guys. You're our future. Uh, I've gotten involved in the last several years with uh, junior fishermen and the Junior World Championship. They have uh, high school and and even grade school fishing today and collegiate fishing. I understand you guys have a team. Thumbs up on a fishing team. How many people in here fish? Well, I'll pray the rest of you will get your priorities straight. <laughs> That's pretty cool. I, uh, I'm encouraged to, uh, to help these young kids with these junior championship and high school fishing uh, become uh, more grounded in the fundamentals of fishing. But you know, fishing's really not all that important. About a million years from now, junior fishing won't be important. But what we do for Jesus Christ a million years from now is gonna be important. What we do and how we train and how we prepare uh, will make a difference in lives. It's hope. I'm gonna tell you my story this morning. I, uh, I grew up with the dream of being a professional bass fisherman after I'd pretty much thrown my life away. I, uh, and, and I'm going to tell that story, but before I do, I want to kind of explain what a professional bass fisherman is. A lot of people say, what in the world is a professional bass fisherman? Uh, I, I always uh, feared poverty and I hated work, so it was just a natural gravitation for me. <laughs> you know, uh, people ask me all the time, I travel around the country, give me one tip that would make me a better fisherman. What would that tip be? And it's without a doubt, get rid of that job. That job will mess you up. So I had that fear. And so a professional bass fisherman is a guy that travels around. They have lakes all over America and Canada and even sometimes into Mexico. So we fished a few international tournaments. We have a lot of anglers uh, that have come to America to fish from Japan. So they have a world championship tournament at the end of the year. And so that's everybody's goal. When I was 15 years old, I read about these guys making a living bass fishing. And I decided that's what I wanted to do. And that kind of became my hope. That was my carried in life. That's what gave me inspiration. That's what gave me a cause. And I didn't know Jesus Christ, didn't know anything about a Christian life, didn't know anything about happiness, didn't know anything about peace, didn't know anything at all about contentment. All I knew was uh, a troubled life. I, uh, I had a dad who had a fifth grade education. My dad was one of the smartest guys I've ever met in my life and had a fifth grade education. And uh, he, uh, he became a drunk and his life became chaotic. But I, I want to tell you how he changed and how he spread the gospel. And his priorities in his life was to see his children saved once he became saved. And I want to tell that story, but I want to tie this because I think it is so important as you guys train to go out and be an ambassador for Jesus Christ. We live in a world today that is hostile to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our news media is absolutely hostile uh, to the gospel of Jesus Christ. They almost look at you as if you are a gigantic bigot, if you're someone who is primitive in your mindset, and they try to demean you with their knowledge. The Bible says, professing to be wise, they became fools. And they'll see one day, they will see, because they will bow before God. And they will acknowledge Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords. They will acknowledge that someday. But until they do, their desire is to grind you up. And anybody that stands for God, they want to destroy you. I was with Fred Luter. Fred Luter just came off of uh, serving as the uh, 
as the president of the Southern Baptist Convention. And he was telling me that uh, one of the toughest uh, interviews that he did while he was president of the Southern Baptist Convention was with CNN News and Anderson Cooper. Anderson Cooper is a professing homosexual, and he has a hard time with the Bible. He has a hard time with what God has to say about that lifestyle. And Fred Luter was telling me how difficult and how wise. Anderson Cooper is a very, very smart, polished individual who is supposed to be a newscaster, I think it's hard to get non-biased. You know, everything is so sensationalized. It's really hard to get a journalist these days. You don't get the truth, you get their opinion, and they will build a story, and they'll base it on the foundation of their opinion, so you very rarely uh, get a pure commentator who is going to deliver you the news. So Anderson Cooper uh, switched in the middle of the conversation with Fred Luter and began to attack him for his philosophy on same-sex marriage. And it became, it became uh, almost like a grudge match that Anderson Cooper was going to prove Fred Luter wrong. And I said, you know, Brother Fred, I would have done what my father did with me. And I'm gonna, I'll tell you that as we go along this morning. But he said, what would that be? And I said, just read him out of God's word. Don't inject any opinion or analysis or philosophy or personal points of views. Just simply read what God said. And then you would have to, Anderson Cooper would no longer be discussing with Fred Luter but he would be arguing with God. So instead of you voicing your opinion, read to him exactly, word for word, what God says. Read Romans 1, starting in about verse 18, and read what God says about the lifestyle. Don't be non-compassionate. God loves the homosexual as much as he loves the heterosexual. God hates sin, period. So don't apologize, but at the same time, don't be so bold that it appears that you have prejudice toward their sin or sin of anybody's. Just simply read what God says. And I think that if you will put Anderson Cooper or anyone else in the position that they're not debating with you, but they're actually arguing with God. I think you will find that Anderson Cooper, with all his knowledge and all his education and all his abilities, will be no match for God's Word. That's what my father did with me. And I'm going to tell you the story real quickly. I grew up in a little town made in North Carolina. My dad uh, was a great dad. Played ball with my brother and I in the yard. And... Uh, Every afternoon when he got off from work, and take a, he would take us fishing in the spring and the summer, take us hunting in the fall and the winter, and uh, he was a great dad. We spent time together, and I don't know, it's just something special. When your dad puts his arm around you, I mean, like the whole world is okay. And it, it's just awesome, and, and I love my dad. My dad liked a good cold beer on the weekends. He'd get off from work on Friday, drink a good cold beer, led to two cold beers, led to three cold beers, led to a case, led to hard liquor. My dad became a drunk. Let me tell you about Satan. I'm a bass fisherman. It's what I do. My job is to make an artificial lure look so realistic that that fish can't refuse it. And I lie to him. I'm like the devil. I make that bait look so good you can't believe, man, he's got to have it, and then I snatch him hooks in his face. And I really mean The devil will do the same thing. Man, you look at them Miller High Life commercials and the guys in the Rolls Royce got the big Rolex watch, got beautiful women, got it all going. That's a lie. If you want to see the real Miller High Life, go to the project. Go where the little kids don't have shoes. That's where I became. That's where my environment was. My dad became a drunk. It wasn't a Rolex and it wasn't a Rolls Royce, but it was cigarettes and liquor and no food, no shoes, no driver's license, no car, poverty. 
Chaos. That's what my life became. My dad was sucked into the lie of, hey, man, you worked hard all week. There's never been, now listen to me, you're young. There's never been an alcoholic that didn't drink the first beer. There's never been a dope addict that didn't do his first drug. So if you never drink a beer, you never do alcohol, you never do drugs, you'll never be a drug addict. That's for sure. All the rest is up in the air. Some people drink beer socially and have no problem. Others become alcoholics. I don't know. Who is that one going to be? I guess it's a game of chance. Not sure. But my dad became a drunk. My dad could not get sober. My dad quit drinking every Monday morning for about seven or eight years. And his goal was, with every fiber in his body, was I'm not going to get drunk anymore. I am going to go to work. I'm going to support my family. I'm going to get my life straightened out. I am through with alcohol. Monday morning, it's over. I'm done. I got drunk this weekend, but I'm going to be sober from here on out. I quit for about seven years every week. Same routine. The fact is the addiction was greater than his will. Sometimes we think we can do things in our own strength and our own power. Sometimes we can, but most of the time we can't. The Bible teaches us clearly that we're a sin, either to Je we're a slave to either Jesus Christ or the devil, one or the other. Human flesh is dependent. You're either going to serve God or the devil, and one's going to control you. The Bible says we can't serve two masters. One of them is going to control you. The devil was controlling my dad. And he thought that, hey, I can handle this. I'll, I'll, I'll quit drinking. He did that. But then he'd go right back. And it controlled him. If you've ever lived in a home where there's an addiction, it's a chaotic place to be. Forrest Gump says life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. A drunk's like a box of chocolate. You never know whether he's going to come home mad, happy, sad, or glad, mean, and violent. You don't know. Every day was a, was a new day. My dad left my mom, and our life became more chaotic. I stayed with my dad. My brother and my sister went with my mom. But one Saturday, my, my grandfather, I'm going to back up for just a second. Before all this took place, before my mom left my dad, my grandfather, my mom's father, my dad's father-in-law, had sent my dad to dry out facilities where you quit drinking, where you overcome alcohol. Uh, and my dad would go, and he would dry out, and he would go through the 30-day process, sometimes six-week process, come back, first thing you do is get drunk. And my grandfather made the statement one day, my dad's name was Mo. My grandfather made the statement one day, Mo Parker is a drunk, he's going to live a drunk, and he's going to die drunk. There ain't no hope for Mo Parker. I have spent my last dime. I have sent him to the last... AA camp, dry out camp, I'm through. There is no hope for Mo Parker. And that was my grandfather. And you can't blame him. He spent a lot of money, went through a lot of heartache. His daughter was married to a drunk that was abusive. So he was fed up. He was done. He saw no hope. My dad and I were at home one Saturday morning. My dad already drank about a half a bottle of liquor. It was about 10 o'clock in the morning. A guy knocked on the door, came to see my dad, and said, Mo, I saw in the paper where you and your wife, Virginia, my mom, are going to get a divorce. And he said, I hate that. I hate to see a family broken up. So said, Mo, I just came by to talk to you, but I see you got Hank here with you, and you're going to have father-son time, and I don't want to bother that. But, Mo, I'd like to leave you with one thought, one question. If you died today, do you know where you would spend eternity? And my dad said, for whatever reason, that bothered him. I heard him say later he drank the rest of the bottle of liquor he had opened and opened another bottle of liquor and drank a part of that before he tried to pass out. But he couldn't pass out, and he couldn't get that thought. He could not get that thought out of his mind. So the next day, my dad walked out of our house about 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning, no driver's license, no car, so he called that same man that came by to see us, got a ride to church. And he left out there about 11 o'clock, a drunk, and came home a saint. My dad got saved. I had no idea what that meant. 
I had no clue. I thought, well, one time he went to one of those meetings, they got a focus group that said, Mo, what you need to do is set goals and focus on those goals, and you can overcome your addiction. That lasted about two weeks, so I'm thinking, hey, now he's found religion. How long will that last? Maybe he'll get three weeks out of this deal. Well, he did. He got three weeks, three months, six months, a year. My dad did 180. I mean, it was an about face. He was pointing south, and he turned north. My mom came home. We got the liquor out of the house. You know, for a long time, all we had in the house was liquor and cigarettes. We got all that out of the house. We got food, mowed the grass. My dad got driver's license back, got a car, started working. Our home became a great place. But let me tell you, during that process of time, there's always a penalty for sin. There is always a price to pay. God can restore you. God can restore us all. When we fall, God will help us get back up. But we won't forego the scars of sin. I was the scar. I was the victim. During all that time, my dad was a drunk, my mom was gone, I had absolutely no adult supervision. If I wanted to stay out on a school night till 3 o'clock in the morning and break in cigarette machines or drink machines and steal and become a little rogue, my privilege. There was no one that gave me any discipline, guidance, supervision. I was on my own. When I was 11, o'clock, uh, 11 years old, 12 years old, 13 years old, Oh, I'd be out to 2 o'clock in the morning. I never came home. I'd be doing all kinds of things. You know, the, my grandmother used to say nothing good happened after midnight, and there's a lot of truth to that. Man, midnight, I'd, be, I'd just be getting started. Be a school night. I didn't go to school. All I did was break in machines and steal what I could and do what I could do to what I thought would have a good time. And I was truly a hellion. The Apostle Paul said he was the chief of sinners. I gave him a great run for that title. Not proud of that, but that's who I was, and that's what I was, and I had no hope. Just like Mo Parker had no hope. My grandfather thought Mo, Hart, Mo Parker had no hope. But Jesus, Jesus can fix anything. Jesus rose Lazarus after he'd been dead four days. It was as miraculous when he rose Mo Parker. Mo Parker was a hopeless drunk that tried and tried and failed and failed. But one day, the gospel of Jesus Christ changed his life. Now he started talking to me. Hank, what about you? The same question that was asked of me, where will you spend eternity? Where is your hope? How about it? I'm okay. Dad, I'm okay. I promise you, I'm okay. He said, so what do you mean by okay? How are you okay? I said, well, Dad, look at your life. Look at who you were and think about it. You were a drunk. You had no hope. You, couldn't, you could not control your life. So you had to have a dramatic salvation experience. You had to have a dramatic salvation experience. I'm not there. Dad, I'm going to be a fisherman. My goal is to be a fisherman. I'm not a drunk. I've cleaned up my life. I'm not breaking in machines anymore. I'm not doing any of that stuff. I'm focusing on being a professional bass fisherman. That's where my hope is, and that's what I'm going to do. He said, well, what happens, Hank, if you die? I said, Dad, first of all, I'm young. I got a lot of time. He said, well, you don't know that. You're not guaranteed tomorrow. You don't know something might happen in that boat and you might drown. Anything could go wrong. And what's going to happen? The Bible says it's appointed unto man to die once and after that the judgment. So there's no hope. Once you die, you're going to stand before God. I said, well, if I stand before God, I'm okay. He said, what do you mean you're okay? I said, well, I think it's common sense that if your good outweighs your bad, you're going to heaven. And if your bad outweighs your good, you're going to hell. And I think given the circumstances, knowing that I had no parents, that I had no supervision, that if I died, God understands all that. God understands what I've been through. And so if you consider all the negative things, I'm really not that bad of a guy. I think if I was put on the scales, my good would be 
okay under the circumstances. He said, okay, let me ask you something, son. Do you believe the Bible? And I thought about that because there were a few times that I would bless my teachers with my presence at school. And I do remember once that our biology teacher, by the way, this morning was the first morning I've ever been in the dean's office, or we call them the principals because we didn't have deans in high school. First time I've been in the dean's office, I wasn't in trouble. <laughs> Pretty cool to be in there, Dr. Cantor, this morning. We laughed and had a good time, prayed. Everything was good. I didn't have to stand in the corner or write anything or go home with a note. It was really good. But I said, uh, yeah, I think I believe the Bible. I remember Miss Miller telling us about how the earth was formed, how there was two pieces of dust. I'm not sure where the dust came from, but somehow those two specks of dust collided and there was some kind of molecular spark that occurred and there was a great explosion and there was earth and water and tadpole and monkey and here I am. That is some far-fetched stuff. <laughs> and the Bible says in the beginning was God and the Word was God and He created the heavens and the earth and that made more sense to me than anything. So I said, yeah, I believe the Bible. He said, okay, do you think that in the Bible it teaches you that the way a person goes to heaven is your good outweighs your bad. And I said, yeah, I'm sure it does. He said, okay, can you find that verse of scripture for me? I said, well, I'm a pretty slow reader, but I'll do my best and I'll try to find it for you. So that rocked on for a while. He would ask me kind of day to day, hey, you got that scripture for me? No, I hadn't found it yet, but I'm looking. Now, here's where wisdom came in. I don't know where this came from. I don't know if someone taught this to my dad. I don't know if the Holy Spirit directed my dad. But I am a very headstrong, rebellious person. I'm wrong a lot, but I'm never unsure. I'm always self-confident. My dad knew that about me. So my dad said, well, let me show you. He didn't say, let me tell you what's in the Bible. This was wisdom. My dad said, let me show you what I know that is in the Bible while you continue to look for the scripture that you feel that is in the Bible. And he says, if you look over here in Romans in verse 3, chapter 3 and verse 10, it says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. And then if you look in verse 23 of chapter 3, it says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, there's nothing in there that I see that makes an exception when it says all. As it is written, there is none. All and none has to pretty much include Hank Parker. And it says over here in Romans 6 and 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. So far, Hank, the way this thing reads, I don't know about this good and bad deal. I said, well, Dad, let me just tell you where you're at. You're, you're so black and white. You're so absolute. I, I'm not there. I mean, I'm not, you're, you're trying to make it look like I'm against God. I'm not against God. I'm just not all in like you are. I mean, you, you're a fanatic. My dad goes to church on Monday night visitation, go Wednesday night services, twice on Sunday. What's up with all that? Man, I couldn't believe it. So I said, I'm not against God. I'm just not all in like you are. He said, okay, all right, let's see what the Bible, now here comes wisdom. Do not that well, son, that's not the way it works. None of that. Well, let's see what the Bible says about that. And he said, let's look over here in Matthew uh, chapter 30, I mean chapter 12 and verse 30. He who is not with me is against me. There's no common ground. It's not like you're not all in. You're either with him or against him. I said, well, Dad, I don't believe that. Well, wait a minute. I thought you said you believed the Bible. I said, well, I do, but I don't believe that part. He said, okay, all right, that's good. Let's go back over here in Romans 3 and verse 3 and see what the Bible says about that. The Bible says, 
For what if some did not believe? Will their unbelief make the faithfulness of God without effect? God forbid. Let God be true and every man a liar. You see, whether it be Hank Parker or Anderson Cooper, you can only argue with the scripture for so long. My dad, I could find fault with my dad and I could argue with my dad. But I was arguing with the Bible. I was arguing with God. And I'll be honest with you, I ran out of arguments. So I couldn't deal with it. I could not deal with it. I had to run. You see, the gospel of Jesus Christ will make you mad, sad, or glad, but it will not leave you neutral. you got to deal with it. That's why the Bible says in Romans 1, they did not want to retain God in their knowledge. they got to get rid of the Bible. Have you ever seen in your lifetime, I'm a little bit older than you guys. I think I qualified for that senior citizen visit of yesterday. But it, there's never been a time in my lifetime where there's been such an attack on the Bible. And it goes right back. They do not want to retain God in their knowledge. You know, there's not a real big effort to wipe out the Koran. There's not a real big effort to wipe out Buddhism. There's not a real big effort to wipe out any religion except the Bible. Why? Because the Bible's real. It's the Word of God. The Holy Spirit is real. It's a lie. It's offensive it is offensive. The gospel of Jesus Christ will offend you. It offended me. I'm very much offended of the fact that my good's not going to outweigh my bad, and I have got to submit myself, swallow all my pride, and say, I can't do it. I'm determined to do it. I'm offended at that. I would tell my dad, Dad, I cannot believe that a God created me and then is going to send me to hell. I had nothing to do with it. He said, son, he sent the Lord Jesus Christ to die on a cross that you wouldn't have to go to hell. You don't understand. No, I didn't understand. I didn't want to understand. I did not want to deal with it, so I ran. He would send men from his church to come talk to me. If I saw them in time, before they got in the house and I could make it to the kitchen and get out the back door, down through the woods I'd go. I could not deal with it. I couldn't deal with it. That's why there is such an effort to stomp out the gospel of Jesus Christ, get it out of schools, get it out of courthouse, get it out of legislation, get it away because it is real and it's offensive. If you want to live like the devil, the Bible says they prefer darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. The light exposes their light every time the gospel of Jesus Christ is like flicking on a light switch to a sinner. They hate it. They hate it. They want to get rid of it. I was in that category. I wanted to get rid of it. Man, I didn't want to deal with it. I wasn't going to surrender my life to Jesus Christ. I'm going to be a professional bass fisherman. Man, I'm a high school dropout. I don't have anything going for me. I'm a loser. I am a big loser. The only hope I got is to be a fisherman. Please don't mess that up. Get this gospel away from me. He'd send these guys, and if they, did, if they made it in the house before I could get to the back door, I'd go out the bedroom window. It didn't matter. Man, I couldn't stand it. It was like the hot sun burning you. I, I couldn't stand it. So that went on, and I ran for year after year after year after year. I was scared to death. I was miserable. My dad would ask me from time to time, son, let me ask you a question. Deep down in your heart, do you have peace? And I would lie like a dog. I'd say, oh, yeah, man, I've got peace. I lay down, I sleep like a baby. I didn't. I was miserable. I was unhappy. I was empty. But I wouldn't admit it. I'm empty inside. So I ran. My dad went with a group of men to White City, Kansas, and got killed in a car wreck on the way home. They were up there building a mission home. When he came home, his body, they sent his Bible. My dad and his preacher had become best friends in the period of time that they were, my dad was saved. He got saved in 1975. He got killed in 19, he got saved in 1970, got killed in 1975. So for five years, my dad was the most dynamic Christian you've ever seen in your life. He witnessed to every person he saw. He embarrassed me to death. I hated it. But he left a note in his Bible. 
Now, he and his pastor had become best friends over that period of five years. So his pastor's flipping through the Bible, reading footnotes that my dad had written on different sermons that he had preached. And he found a note. And the note said, Brother Grady, if you find this note before I'm buried, it is my last wish that instead of you preaching a traditional funeral service, that you'd preach the gospel at my funeral. I have two boys that are lost. It may be the last time this side of eternity that they hear the gospel. You know, we get pretty secure in life. We don't really think a lot about death till it comes close, till it's somebody we love, till it's somebody we care about. And then that reality rings true, and it's very sobering. And it shows you that you're not invincible. And I sat right here on this front row at my dad's funeral, and the preacher preached the gospel. And all those scriptures that my dad had read in that Bible, they came back. They never did leave. The Holy Spirit was right there. And the whole time I'm sitting there thinking, I'm not going to get saved, man. I'm going to be a professional fisherman. And the Holy Spirit just kept sawing. And the Word of God kept cutting my heart. And it got to the point that, you know, I didn't really care if I ever fished again. I didn't care what happened to me. I had to have some relief. I was as miserable as a human being could be. And at my dad's funeral, I quit fighting. I quit running. I listened to the truth of the gospel. And I accepted Jesus Christ at my dad's funeral. My brother accepted Jesus Christ at my dad's funeral. Our whole family saved. It's incredible. Somebody said, well, Hanky, I tell you what, you've had an incredible life. You've gone on and you're an incredible winner. You look at where you were and you're an incredible winner. And that is the truth. Two world championships. In spite of that, I'm a winner because I know Jesus Christ is my Savior. Those bass tournaments were big and important to me at the time. They're not even important to me now, let alone in eternity. The things that we set in our lives that are so important to us, a million years from now, how big a deal is that going to be? Your exams, all the pressure of being a student, all the pressure of all the hard work that you have to go through, how important is that going to be? I'm going to tell you something. I became a world champion bass fisherman because I never felt like 99 was a good number if 100 is achievable. Work, work, work work and I was able to be successful you guys are in a college that are preparing to go out into the world a college that's based on the foundation of the scriptures of Jesus Christ 99 is not a good number train work work where you'll be able to serve God I would love to be able to go back in my life instead of being a high school dropout I would love to go back and fix all of that and become a doctor or master degree where I could have credibility when I talk about Jesus Christ. People say, well, you're a stupid old dropout. What do you know? I know he's real. I know he can take a drunk and make him a saint. I know he can take a rebellious young man that had absolutely no hope and no foundation and no basis for life and can turn his life into something meaningful. I know he can take that empty place inside of your heart and I know he can turn that around and fulfill it when nothing else could, nothing else ever did. I know he can do that. I tell you the one thing that we have that God don't have. And I never take for granted. I never take for granted. I'll guarantee you there is somebody with all these people in this room, there's somebody in this room right now that don't know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. There's someone here today that has never, ever came face to face with Jesus Christ and accepted him as their Savior. The one thing that we have that God don't have is grandchildren. I have 11 grandchildren. They are so cool. It's awesome. But God don't have grandchildren. I don't care how great of a saint your mom is, your dad your grandmother, your grandfather, your uncle, if you personally have never accepted Jesus Christ, 
you don't have any hope. I talk to people all the time. It will amaze you. It is totally, absolutely staggering and so disappointing. I go fishing with people all the time, and I say, hey, let me ask you something, John, Jim, Jack, Bob, whatever your name is. When you die, what have you done that God's going to let you into his heaven? Oh, Hank, man, I tell you what, I've been so faithful to my wife. I have a, I have a wonderful wife. We've had an awesome marriage. That's wonderful. Man, I am a great provider. I've got kids. I put all my kids through college. Hey, boy, I'll tell you what. I do a lot for our community. I, I work with the Lions Club. I sold 45 brooms last month. Man, I, I, I'm, on, I'm, I'm on this committee, that committee. I'm serving. It's unbelievable how many hollow answers. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith. That not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Can't get there the way Hank Parker wanted to get there. It's about Jesus Christ. It's about his shed blood. It's about his forgiveness. My favorite scripture, it gives me so much peace, is 1 John 5, 12, and 13. It says, he that has the Son has life. He that has not the Son of God has not life. These things have I written unto you that believe that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. We're in a world today where there is absolutely no hope outside of Jesus Christ. But we've always been in a world where there's absolutely no hope without Jesus Christ. The gospel is powerful. The gospel can change a drunk. The gospel can change a terrorist. You know, who was one of the greatest writers in the Bible? You know, if it wasn't for the Apostle Paul, we wouldn't have a lot of the Bible that we have today that is so incredibly rich. But do you know Apostle Paul? Saul was a terrorist. He held the clothes while they stoned Stephen to death. He was on a mission to go to destroy Christians when he was called out on the Damascus Road. God changed Saul the terrorist to Paul the saint. That's what the power of the gospel. There is nothing ever, never has been, never will be. There is nothing as powerful as the gospel of Jesus Christ. Learn it. Cherish this book. Cherish your Bible. Be challenged to learn everything you can. Be challenged to be the very best you can be in training to go out into a lost world where there's very, 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 very little hope because there's very few given the gospel. The Bible says the field is white on the harvest, but the laborers are few. There are very few people out there today that's willing to stand to Anderson Cooper or anybody else. And I don't mean to pick on Anderson Cooper. There's a whole world of Anderson Coopers. There's a whole world of people who are intelligent but are lost. They don't know the gospel. They don't know hope. They're full of pride. They're full of self-education. And outside of the gospel, there's no hope. Thank you.